This is Keyed In with Max and Brent, unlocking the minds of the industry's top real estate professionals. And now, here are your hosts, Max Rabin and Brent Jackson. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Keyed In Podcast. I'm your host, Max Rabin. And I'm Brent Jackson. So, Brent, I didn't see you at the company picnic last night. I was not there. So my wife had a firm happy hour. Okay. So I took, and it's a nightmare. So I had to pick up <laughs> my uh, son from College Park, Maryland at three, what time? Four o'clock. Yeah. So it was a nightmare getting up there. I left at three, got there at four, came back because she went to her happy hour. I had to pick up a little girl. Then we went down to, uh, it's called the district court for basketball practice. It's mm-hmm. way down right outside the beltway. So it took me an hour to get there. We stopped and had uh, dinner at Jimmy John's. He had practice from six to eight. And then when I got home, I went straight to bed. <laughs> so, yeah. Put that's... him in the bed. So I didn't, I didn't, was unable to go to the uh, company picnic. Well, it was fun. Once again. I heard it was amazing. I saw yeah. photos. Yeah. Our company does a really nice job with those kinds of things. Um, well, today our guest is not from our company. Switching it up a little bit. Um, today our guest is Daryl Judy with Washington Fine Properties. Uh, Daryl is a former teacher. I didn't know that until we were doing your bio stuff. Um, you've been in the business a long time. We're going to talk about how long and um all of your secrets to success the great things you're doing you're an extreme top producer i was just like reviewing your numbers in home i was like good god big stuff right he's crushing it it's just crazy i mean and i was also noticing like on your your listing sides like your time of sale like your average time of sale at, at those price points is also pretty sharp so kudos man thanks welcome to the show thank you for having me so, yeah, thanks for being here. So one thing I want to point out yeah. is I love doing the podcast because we get some of our top competitors on the show. And Daryl Judy is the cream of the crop for us because you, I can you're in t- a lot of direct competition. We're in direct competition. Yeah. So it's like a couple of times a month we're going up against Daryl Judy. And I'm always totally cool if he gets it. Uh, Class Act does a great book of business. So if a seller comes back to us and says, hey, we're going to Daryl Judy, I'm like, that's cool. He's one of the best in the business. So we don't mind losing to Daryl Judy. Yeah, thanks. And that's why that's why we not say, every time, safe though. for you to be on the show. Otherwise, Thank you. I like a safe space. Yes. yes. Right. Um, so let's just start off with that. So why don't you take us from the beginning? Um, so when you got started in real estate, where are you from? Go ahead and speak. Let us know. Okay. So I actually grew up not too far away in Pennsylvania. Okay. Um, I was raised in the country, right? And ended up working on a dairy farm and really kind of very rural. Um, I went to Penn State. Mm-hmm. And Nittany I, Lion. I'm a Nittany Lion. We are, exactly. Um, and I started out teaching. So I taught elementary school. And I started out in Camp Hill, Pennsylvania, which is two hours south. Taught there a while. And then I'm like, oh my God, I want to move to DC. So I why? Came, why? Quite honestly, it was because um, I had come out as being gay and I couldn't live and teach in Camp Hill. It was not, it was, it was not safe. It wow. was not conducive. It was terrifying. Um, and I was very concerned for my safety and right. also for my career. Mm-hmm. So quite honestly. And then I came down with friends one time to a gay pride. I'm like, what's a gay pride? And then all of a sudden I met all these people who were like lawyers and doctors and think tank and smart and educated and had houses and were amazing. And I was like, oh, my God, this could be my life. So quite Absolutely. honestly, that's that's the move to DC. Wow. Yeah. Um, so I came down here and I taught, um, here for a while, but it was a different situation in a, in a rural, in a, in a urban area, mm-hmm. a little different. And mm-hmm. also it's some distance there. Um, and so I taught for a couple more years here, um, couldn't survive eating or living in my friend's basement. So, um, I had a lot of friends who were in pharmaceutical sales. Mm-hmm. And so I said, let me do that. I can do that. If they can do it, I can do it. And so, um, I ended up getting a really great job with a biotech company. And I did biotechnology sales and marketing for 10 years. You did wow. that for 10 years? 10 years. I didn't know you were in pharmaceuticals because I was in pharmaceuticals yeah. for off and on for about five years because we moved from West Virginia. I did it for a year, New York for a year, and then D.C. for like two or three years. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I was lucky because I had a specialty, so it's kind of interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, it wasn't like the normal pharmaceutical gig. Um and I had great companies. I was doing sales and doing really well. Um, I went through three companies with Wyeth Aerist at the time, which is now Pfizer. 
um, Sanofi Synthelwell, which is now Sanofi Ventus, which is the biggest. Yeah. And then I ended up at Genentech in mm -hmm. San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And that's like, that's the cream of the crop. If you ever want to work for a company, that's the company to work for. Um, and they were great to me and I loved the people there. I just didn't like corporate America. Right. And I wanted to have control of if I sell more, I make more. If I work harder, I can do better. And in corporate America, they kind of stamp that down, I feel. Right? Yes. Especially in sales. You know from when you yes. did it. It's like, oh, your goal is 100 units of whatever. And you do 120. So you get paid a little bit of a bonus more. And the next time, it's 300. Right. Right? Yeah. I, I, so I was with uh, GlaxoSmithKline and Sanofi as well. Plavix was one of my drugs. Plavix. Right? Um, but it was so monotonous. Like when I first got in, you, you, the uh, benefits were great. Cars, health insurance, retirement, the bonuses. Uh, the pay was really good and the hours were flexible. I learned early on to like focus on the top 20% of my doctors. So the bottom 80% I wouldn't even call on. So when I was in New York, I would go, my territories from 60th to 80th from Fifth Avenue over to York. And I'd go 61, 62, drop off my drugs in the storage unit and I'd be done in like two hours. But I'd only call on the top doctors because I realized that those are the doctors that are writing your prescriptions but it was so monotonous every day you're going in with the same message and you felt like you were like a little peant in my job right you might have been a little different in biotech and the specialty but <clears throat> for the pharmaceutical and i love those guys to death i still have a lot of friends in there and it's a great job if if you like it i think you got to find your passion in life and that was not my passion right well it's it's also so regulated and it should be right, right? what you can say and what you can't say but it was kind of dumbed down you know because right. This is the message. This mm -hmm. is how you're going to deliver it. This is the sales pitch and so on. So right. this being able to transfer then to real estate, I thought when I start my own career, I have control over it. Um, I don't, I'm not stuck typically with a client I don't like, which you can happen in biotech, right? right. Um, here, if we don't gel, then we don't have to work together. But I wanted destiny, what I wanted to do. And I also had this ability to like, in terms of design and getting houses ready and vision, I think that's a strength for me. So yeah. it made sense. So, but why real estate? So you were in pharmaceuticals and then like, what was the aha moment? I'm going to switch gears and go into real estate. Again, I saw a lot of people doing it and I'm like, my God, they're not working that hard. You know what no. I mean? <laughs> and it Classic, wasn't, right? yeah. And it's, and for me, that's not me. I, I work like a hound dog. I mean, yeah. I'm like crazy. Right. And so it's not how little can I work, but I want to be rewarded for what I do. And I also want to be able to have some, control and have some interesting things. And I mean, I've met the greatest people during real estate, um, friends, um, a good book of business, both collegially like you guys and, and my clients. And so it's been a great success. And it's also, you know, growing up very poor and then teaching for a while. And even in biotech, I did well, but I didn't make that kind of money. Right. It's actually changed my life where I'm now the caretaker for people and I'm the one who's able to give gifts you know, and care for. So how, when you first started in a business, how were you finding your clients? How were you, uh, you know, getting people to trust you just because you were just starting out in the, in the business? What, what were you bringing to the table? How'd you do it? So I think the key to, by the way, when was this? What, like what era? Um, this was like in 2006. Okay. Right before the crash. Right. Yes. right? So yeah. I like got in, wouldn't that be great? And then let's have a crash. Um, I believe it's the same then as it is today, and it's about knowledge. Mm -hmm. You got to be knowledgeable. You got to have be informed. You have to know your stuff. You have to be honest and mm -hmm. forthright, and you have to be direct. And I think a problem that a lot of agents get themselves in the day is they blow too much smoke, right? It's like you t they agents tell buyers sellers what they want to hear and not the truth, right? And that's why we go and you know, show something and it's way price it's priced way too high or right. You know what I mean? Or it's like, oh no, don't worry, that wallpaper's fine or that paint's fine. And then it doesn't sell because of that, right? So being honest, being informed, knowing the market. Um, and then starting out, I was pounding the pavement, you know, going to the office every single day, listening, learning, um, going to your sphere of influence and open houses. And it, it always kills me when people say open houses don't sell houses. And I totally disagree um, uh, because you have people that- I, Yeah, but- I've seen you at a lot of open houses. You always, you're always out there. It could be like a hundred degrees out. You're setting up all the signs. You're really, you always do it the same way. I mean, that's like, that takes a level of commitment because some, there are some days where you don't want to, I mean, absolutely. Right. Right. Like, especially you want to go all the way down the block to put up a sign at like 14th street or something, but you're always out there doing it. Right. 
That's 100% true because if you think about it, you spend so much money on postcards, you spend so much money on digital, you spend money, 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 money. And there is a three, I would do three hour opens, right? There's a three hour window where people are, people who are clients are coming in to see you in your product. Right. And you're an idiot to not take advantage of that. Right. And you have a little sandwich sign that you can put like, I will do it four or five, six blocks away. Because in my mind, I'm thinking where well, they're going down M Street, they're coming up Connecticut Avenue, or they're going to be coming this. Like, how can I get them funneled in to see me? And let's have a date. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so I think that's so important. And oh, by the way, that's free. So even if you like 14th Street, if I'm at 14th and NS on a Sunday brunch and there's 5,000 people that walk by and there's like, oh my God, Daryl Judy's so busy. He's selling everything. I didn't sell a single thing maybe, but that sign that was free. Yes. It's like a pain to do it. Do I want? No, it gets tiring, but I think it's important. Yeah. And, and being knowledgeable about the house and all the things, but the market too. Right. I don't sit down and text or play games in my open house. I'm like meeting people and engaging and where you're from and what's going on and what are you looking for? And this, you know, have you seen this? Have you seen that house? Have you seen this sale? So you want to be knowledgeable. And I think that I've done well with that. I think you're one of the best open house definitely hosters that I know in the industry. Can you tell us a little bit more about like your secret sauce in that regard as far as like how many signs are you putting out? I know because we're getting clients that go through your open house and you have a phenomenal follow-up email that goes out to everyone. Like how are you capturing? What are you saying to the consumer that comes in off the street to get all these people to sign in? And all, Yeah, to piggyback on that, this is one of my like many failings in my business is getting people to sign in. I've never been really good at that. I remember just shadowing an agent one day um, in McLean just I was just, I just wanted to see how she did an open house because I knew she was really good at it. And she just had this natural way of getting people to sign in that seemed so, uh, like non obtrusive and not like needy. I, so tell, go ahead. You talk about it. Um, it's such a minor thing, but, um, it's uncomfortable, right? Like I want you to sign in. I want you to give me your name. And, and if you're going to lie to me, you're going to lie to me. Like I can't control that. Right. I would say in the past two years, three years, it's been easier because of COVID. Right. And so I'm like, I need you to put in your name and your email and time that you're here. Because if someone comes in, I want to be able to go back and talk to them and say, listen, I don't know if you were there at the same time, but there was someone who was exposed or someone who was sick. So that's changed things a bit. But I represent my seller and they're in their home, right? And so to think that you can just come in ho in the in the house and be like, well, you don't need to know who I am. Um, no, if you're in their home, this is what you need to do, right? And I don't give them the information. I don't get like I don't lay things out and have them just come up and grab things until they sign in, right? Only one time, maybe once there might have been some. Uh, I didn't realize at the time, and then when this person left, I was like, oh my god, that was a Supreme Court justice. Oh wow! And I was on this individual like. I just, and they yeah, were like, like no, no. In. Yeah. yeah, they're like, we prefer not to. I was like, oh, got it. But I like that. I like the idea of like just with, withholding the floor plans, withholding like you want this package. Yeah. Yeah. It's you fine. don't you don't get what you want. So I get what I want. Right. And so I need to be able to tell this is who was here. This is what was going on. And I'm, I have a responsibility to follow up with them as well. So I try to follow up, send them an email. Here's the virtual tour. Here are the floor plans. Oh, there's an offer deadline. We're looking at at offers on Tuesday, whatever it is. You got the information, you got to use it. Right. You know, right. So do you have it? So what are they signing in on? Is it a sheet? A Just card? a sheet. Just a sheet. Yeah. Has everybody's name. You can see Billy. No, Bob signed it's one at a time. One at a time. Yeah. It's one. And plus also with COVID it's one at a time. Right. Um, and I know that there's programs that you can sign in electronically. I think people are suspicious of that. And so I'm just more old school. And then I try to take notes on them too. I just say, you know, this couple lives in the neighborhood, they're renting now or, Really, like I, I'll say he's tall. She's got long hair, so I remember, right? Because I'm a visual person. So, how does um, you, Brent, how does your team do sign-ins at open houses? Do you use a sheet or using QR use codes? Use a sheet. So, yeah. I mean, I use a sheet, and I think it has everybody's name on it. So, I usually sign like the first two or fake names, so they don't feel like they're the first one to sign in. Mm -hmm. uh, some people use the electronic sign-in sheet. Some people use like the one-off cards where you get the card, they sign on, flip it over on the back, and do notes like Daryl just uh, mentioned. Right. Right. We started using a QR code um, just so people could just sign in on our like Google forms on their phone. And again, it's really more about like getting people to do it, right? Because their their first inclination is I don't want to sign in and give my information away. So right. yeah. 
So what is the package that you have? Like, so they come in, they sign in, and then what package? What's all in that information that you're giving the consumer? So I give, so there's, whether it's floor plans or the brochure or whatever, I, th I think the brochures, like, it's like selling real estate in 1978. Like, who needs a brochure today? I right. think it's crazy, right? And so I think that's a waste of money. I'd rather spend money on a video where someone's actually going to see it and obtain information. Um, but the one thing that I do that's kind of the secret sauce is I, I give market data. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I'm selling this condo. I'm selling this house with a pool. I'm selling. So I give data to show these are other things that are for sale that are kind of in this range or this is what has sold. So it gives you an idea. So you're informed, right? Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, I would say many, many more people now come in with agents than they did before. Right. So I don't really pick many people up, but it gets good information to support the value of the home that I'm selling. That's a good segue. I was going to, my next question was going to be, can you quantify, because you are so successful with open houses, like 10% of your business or 20% of your business comes from open houses, whether it's a buyer or a seller? I would have to track. I would say it's maybe like 10%. It's not a lot. Right. No. It was much more before. Um, and now there's so many agents in the field, I think, like you can't swing a dead cat and not know somebody who's got an agent friend or 20, right. right? And so I don't pick up as many from opens as I used to. It's really more a referral basis and people are like, oh, I know he sold this or he represented my friend and getting it that way. Yeah, my take on it is like, I don't want to pick up a buyer like a cold lead. Like I don't think I'm great with a cold lead coming through at an open house. But for me, it's a way to audition for other neighbors coming through. Like this guy knows his stuff. He has a great package. Uh, he's very sharp, so I'm hoping that they call me back. And then we're doing like just listed flyers, other open houses. They're going to call me down the road, selling their house. So it's just a, a way to stay in front of those people on a regular basis. Our guest today is Daryl Judy with Washington Pine Properties. Um, Daryl, you were talking a little bit about um, working with clients. Like, if you you feel like if you're not going to gel with them, that you wouldn't work with them. Um, but what about the conversations when you're when you have to be honest with someone? You walk into their house, like a townhouse in Georgetown or Logan Circle, and the decor isn't like is not you know it's not going to be make for good photos. You know it's not going to make for a good presentation, and they're really into their stuff. Like, how do you have that conversation with the seller? Um, I wish there was a secret. I the one thing is, listen, I'm not giving you my opinion, right? I'm just giving you information because how you sell a home is different than how you live in a home. And we want to open up this home to as many people as possible. We want to neutralize it. Or I would say we kind of want to dumb it down, right? Because I love that those rugs that you have. And I love the color of that dining room. And it's I, that chandelier is amazing, in my opinion. But generally, that's not what the public, the buyers are looking for. And so we want to reduce it to bring as many people of your taste, reduce that taste to bring as many buyers in as possible. And if we don't do that, we're probably going to sell for less money. Right. So we're going to find you a new home that you can put all those beautiful things in. But we need to change it to bring more buyers in to get you a higher number. Right. And it's really about ripping the bandaid off. Mm -hmm. You're either a buyer or you're either a seller or you're not a seller. You're not both. I want to sell my house. If you want to sell your house, then we have to get rid of the red dining room. No, yeah. I don't want to get rid of it. Then you're not a seller. Yeah. You're going to you're going to get serious about doing the things that it takes to really sell a house in the right. market. Yeah. I don't know what your experience is. I think for me, it's much easier today than it used to be. I remember going back like however many years and being like, oh, we know stage. I'm like, stage? What stage? Is? Right. We need to paint. I'm not. Wouldn't you say now it's changed? Everybody seems Everyone to understand know the it. game. Yeah. They understand it. They, we, we always, when we feel like there might be a resistance point there, we make it really clear that our first introduction to 99.9% .9 of all the buyers is going to be in the photographs. So if they're looking at something cluttered, dark, painted, weird, like we have a listing right now where, you know, the sellers, they love the color blue. So all of the walls are this kind of baby blue. When you're in the house, it's actually a little appealing, but on photos, it's very blue. So it's not selling. Yeah. No, I tell them it's like, it's, it's kind of like people who date on the internet, right? You get swipe left or swipe right, whatever that is. And you get one chance to make a first impression. And how are you going to make that impression? Because when someone when someone's like, well, you're not getting showings. No one's seeing the house. No, they have seen the house. They've already said no to you. Mm -hmm. They've said no. They haven't got through the fresh the threshold because based on your photos or location or whatever it is, they've already said no. Mm -hmm. So they are saying no to you. This is not 
in 2022, we're not, how many people can we get into the open house and let's throw a party and let's get more people in. No, they, they don't have time for swiping. They want to be engaged online. They're looking at Zillow in the middle of the night. They want to see gorgeous photos. And yeah, with the super dark colors and the weird stuff, it's it's only going to be an anomaly. You're going to end up on Zillow gone wild. Right. Yeah. Real estate porn is real. Right? Yes. People spend a lot of time on it. Yeah. It has been for the last two years. That's why the market's been crazy. There was a Saturday Night Live uh, skit oh, yeah, I saw on that, that too. Yeah. And Zillow. Yeah. Uh, for our book of business, it seems like, to your point, Daryl, I think half of our listings, we're able to convince them to move out, whether they go to an apartment, short-term housing, or they've bought their house and moved into it. And then it's easier for us to come behind them and work behind the scenes, whether it's cleaning, painting, landscaping, staging, light handyman stuff, all of that. It's, it's easier. Sometimes it can be challenging if they're living in a home and they're, uh, they have their mind set up that I love this color purple. I, I love purple. And it, it, sometimes that can be challenging if they're a strong mind mindset so what do you do with that person it's just like they're not going to change just black kitchen well i mean you can only do what you can do right and so you also want to talk about the pricing as well like here is the price where i think the value is of the home if we don't do it then it might it might change either you know when we do like paintings or cabinets over or hardware or light staging we're doing things to make it as look as good as possible to get a higher number. So you want to make sure that that what you're spending makes sense on the outcome. Right. And maybe that if you if a, if you have black a black bathroom that's got the black toilet, right? Maybe they're not going to get the money back on replacing that, and that's okay. Right. But the price has to reflect that then that someone's going to come in and want to redo the black bathroom. Sure. So. Um you recently kind of revamped your social media and I want, so this is sort of like a part two. So that was, that's like a, you're at a listing appointment or you're at a, a second meeting with a seller to talk about what to do to get their house ready. In one of your recent uh, posts on Instagram, you're talking about the, the commission thing, negotiating the commission, uh -huh. because it's still an extremely competitive market to try to get listings. It's still a very low inventory market. Um, lots of discounted commissions. We always got Redfin in the market. We've got, you know, you, you might be competing with three or four other agents on a listing. How, what do you say, just like you on the Instagram, what, what are you telling your seller to try to maintain like the, the commission rate that your company wants to charge? So I, I think you have to know your value and I'm not a discount agent. I don't think either of you are, right? And so I've seen over and over again, uh, people getting their discounted commissions out, right? Or we're gonna do this and we're gonna pay for staging and we're gonna do this and we're gonna do that. And I just think nothing's for free. Right. right. Nothing's mm -hmm. for free. Like someone came to me with another firm and they're like, we want to get out of this situation. Well, the other firm had paid for the staging, had paid for the paint and was going to put a lien on the property if you cancel the listing. Right. That's not a situation I put myself in. All of my contractors and stuff, they're, they have, I have no relationship to anybody. So I'm using people because they're actually going to do a great job for you and to get it as good as possible. That's part of the reason that you're using me my experience, my access, my eye, all the things are going to get you a higher number. And if it's naive to think you have real estate agent A bringing a buyer and real estate agent A is going to be more inspired to sell a house with a bigger commission. We want our buyers to get what they want, right? But it is a factor in how hard you push. It just is. Right. Yeah. And so you don't want to disincentivize anyone bringing a buyer to your home. Right. Um, and you want to make sure that you're delivering and you can actually show the numbers and say, here's a discount agent. Here's their average sales price. Here's our average sales price. Interesting. That's right? yeah. You can go yeah. pretty granular with that. Like yeah. in terms of like, here's, yeah, here's, here's, uh, someone who charged this commission and, and how they did with their listing. And you could, you could pull all the data right. from that to That's see smart, if you can correlate. Right? There's all so, kinds of information there. Yeah, for like Michael Rankin's your boss, right? He's one of your owners. He's a 3%, right? It's 3%. He is one of the best agents in all of DC. He's great. In the country. Right. So, so. but he, he sticks with it, right? Whether it's Nancy Taylor Bubas or whoever, you, the top agents are able to do it. Daniel Hyder, he does a full commission. He rocks and rolls, right? If you can't negotiate your own commission, how can you negotiate against someone who's bringing a buyer, right? You want to be strong and know your value. And it, it's also a business, right? You want to handle it in a very thoughtful, meaningful way. 
Um, and I know that sometimes I lose things because I don't pay for staging. I just, I'm not, I'm not a stager. I'm not going to take that responsibility. I'm not going to do it. Like I have someone who wants me to do it for one person. Like I'm not doing it. It's, it's not worth my time. Okay. So fine. So you're obviously, you're clearly very good at getting the commission you want, or you, sometimes it's not worth taking the business. We all agree on that because this could be, uh, you could be foreshadowing the, the rest of the listing oh, with this person for sure. There's demanding. They want it. They want a, uh, a cheaper commission. They want you to pay for all this stuff. And, and if you bend over and say like, okay, fine, I'll, I'll do it. Where's that really leading you with this, this whole operation? Right. But have you ever had situations with friends or family? We always like to work with the people we know. We always get, I, I mean, I feel personally hurt if, if a friend doesn't use me. I know everyone has their people that they've worked with and met out here. And I mean, it's a big city and we've got plenty of agents out here. I think there's, what's the stat? Like everyone knows at least eight or nine real right. estate yeah. at least. But so how would you deal with that if you're like, I'm still Daryl Judy, I'm charging this, uh, this amount, and someone close to you says, well, you know, another agent over here is doing this for me. What do you right. say to that? So it's painful. I like you. I want everyone to use me, all my friends and, and past clients. And um, I can't get over that. That's like, it's like a stab in the stomach, right? When someone totally. doesn't use you. But you, like, how do I des describe it? Hey, Brian, I'm going to sell your house and you're going to be charged this commission. And oh, by the way, I'm not going to charge you the same amount. And you're friends with him. And then they were like, well, how come you gave them that commission? You didn't give me this commission. And I think being consistent in it is also, it's just a good business practice. Fair it's enough. So consistency is, it makes sense. Right. And have I, and have I lost things because of commission? For sure. Absolutely. And like you said, Max, it's, it's a foreshadowing. If this is how we're starting out a relationship, and you can feel it, like you can feel the ground tremble on the first meeting and the second meeting. It's gonna shake like an earthquake by the time we're done. You can just feel it coming a lot of times, right? And so sometimes it's maybe better to not. And and in the past several months, especially, right? It's just been it's been the wild west. Everyone's selling homes. There's 20 offers, 30 offers. That's changing. And I believe there's a flight to Definitely. quality, right? I'm yeah. thrilled for people like you guys. You're gonna have more business this year than you did last year is my prediction because there's a flight to quality people want to know max sold this i saw max thing on TikTok. mac has represented my neighbor max had the highest price on observatory circle max i'm gonna use max because i can't just get away with someone who's a discount person right. who's been in an industry for six months or a year because they sat at home during COVID and realized hey wouldn't this be fun right. i can sell real estate yeah, I mean, that's typically what happens when, when we have to see a market shift. We've seen it before. Um, you know, unfortunately for a lot of people who are newly employed or thinking they were newly employed with this booming market, it goes it goes away very quickly. Right. And you've seen that with some big companies who are laying people oh, off well, and right. starting things. Yeah. Like, so it's, it's about being consistent, doing the right things, having a business, having relationships. That's, that's what separates you guys apart from the rest of the people who aren't really that good is because you run a business and you have knowledge. So I was listening to an interview on uh, another podcast that we, we really enjoy real estate rock stars. And they were talking about, I think you, all of us are in the category of we've worked in enough uh, deals. We've done enough business over the years where we certainly don't need even need another deal, right? It's nice to keep the money rolling in and we enjoy, I enjoy doing my business. I'm sure you do too, but, there's also a place where you're coming from where like, I don't need this. So I'm, I'm doing this because a, this is what, what I do. This is my job and I can do it really well as you can clearly see. And B, I'm not coming from a place of extreme need or, um, scarcity. Right. So that's also a powerful position to be in. And that's what we see in when the market shows you see, that's why you see people who are, you know, unfortunately they're, uh, they don't have that book of business and they don't have the, um, comfort level to make it all happen like the same way. So, well, I think also on that point, Max, that is Daryl and I came in the industry by the same time when the market was going through the roof and then the bottom fell out in the financial crisis. We saw appraisers, title companies, firms, agents all leave the business. And, you know, whether you have financial means or not, I think being able to give your clients sound advice because it's the right thing to do versus I need a paycheck because I haven't eaten in a couple of days uh, goes a long way because you're doing the right thing for the client, not because you want something to close. 
Right. There's a lot of agents out there that live paycheck to paycheck to paycheck. Oh, for sure. Yeah, and I, I still think going back to being honest with your clients, like I, I'll be honest with you, I, I may not be the highest price of a listing of what I'm suggesting, but I'm going to be honest with you, right? Um, but I've I've seen especially the past couple months where it's it's been bonkers, right? Two hundred, three hundred, four hundred, a million dollars over ask. Yes. And when I hear someone say, "Oh my God, my agent did such a great job. We got it done in four hours, and we went a hundred thousand over," and I'm like, "You're an idiot." If you would have let people in, let the other agents cooperated with all the other firms, dealt with each other, let your, your buyers in, they have jobs, let them go see it, let everyone go on Tuesday, let people have pre inspections, it wouldn't have been a hundred, it would have been four hundred or five hundred thousand over, right? And so, I, the past couple of months, you've seen agents who aren't like you experienced, who've been shady and doing things because they don't understand the replications of doing that in the industry, right? right? And so you have to work well with your peers as well to represent and make sure that you're getting the highest number. Yes. So we were talking about on the Instagram, you were talking about how you do the commission uh, conversation. And so I was going through your Instagram. So now you are, you sort of revamped your social media. You're kind of there, there. Are you doing an like off camera kind of thing? Or is it sort of face on? It's like a combination of both, almost like an interview style. Mm -hmm. How did you come up with that? And it seems to be a departure from, I don't know a lot of other agents that are quite doing that in DC right now. So, so again, I, I think I have some beautiful houses that I saw, right? But they can get that on, on any third party platform. They can get on my website or Redfin or Zillow or whoever. People want information. They want knowledge. They want to see behind the scenes. And to me, that's what I have to offer. That's what separates me apart from a lot of people is that I'm a little longer in the tooth. I've been doing this a long time. And I realized at this point in my life, I have things to share, right? And so there's not a formula. I don't say, look, don't look, this is, the I don't have that formula. Um, I shoot a couple of times a month and I have notes. And on my phone right now, if I pick my phone, I'm like, cover the topic of Zillow selling your data. To cover this. It's like, it, as I'm going through my life every day, I think, mm -hmm. oh my God, this just happened and we had HVA system breakdown. How would I tell other people how to deal with that, right? Sure. So it's just notes through, but it's, I want to be an informational source and be seen as someone who's an expert and also be authentic. Like there's, I'm not the person who's going around with the champagne chinging and the car, like that's not who I am. I'm not that person. So I think you have to be authentic to who you are and that's who I am, kind of boring and, you know, just giving information. So on that same line of uh, thought, do you, I mean, like, how do the videos play out? I mean, do you have, like, someone videotaping you? Do you have a script? No script. No, I just have someone videotaping me. And sometimes I think they look at me and they're like, oh, my God, you are so schizophrenic, right? It's like, what are you? But it's come together well. Um, and I don't have a script. Like, it's bad. Like, you talked about the commission thing. Like, that was, we were, like, the day we did that, this is nuts. I did 127 videos in, like, a three-hour period. And he was just like, can I negotiate your commission? What's your best value? It was like, oh, bam, like, boy. like a lightning round. Video. It was lightning round. I was like buzzers. Right. Um, and so that just came off. Everything that I say comes off the top of my head. I don't have a script. I don't have a team that writes for me. It's just, what am I seeing? What am I telling my clients? Like what's That's real? a very interesting way to do that. Like, the, like technically to just knock it all out like that and then edit it, see what, see, see what you get right. from that rather than, redoing it and scripting it. it it goes a lot faster that way because i do a lot of the stuff on TikTok when i'm face up if i'm responding to a comment on TikTok or i just decide there's a topic that i want to talk about usually it's off the cuff sometimes i script a little bit but m when i do it off the cuff it feels better it goes by quicker i can always edit things so that's a great idea right because you guys have knowledge and people want to hear from you they don't, they can, they can go and look at pictures and the videos. We do some of that, but really it's what sets you apart and what is your business? Yeah. Have you gotten any business from that as far as a buyer or a seller reaching out to you because you were so great in your videos? Um, it's interesting. Like I think one thing is when you spend all this time, effort, money, right? Um, mental um, power on it. You want to be liked and have be that affirmation and you have to let go of that. Right. Um, what I have known is, yes, I get people that like it. Like yesterday I did one that was like 10,000 views. 
Wow. Well, that's great. But did that do any? I don't know, right? But what I do know is if I am coming out of church or if I'm coming out of dinner or I see someone at a cocktail party, they're like, oh my God, I love this, or I saw this or this or that. So it's it's people people engaged. If you're if you're getting your validation on someone putting a heart, that's not the way to do it. Right. Because there's there's secret people like they have secret names and they right. want you to know they're watching, right? And so you, I don't know. I think it's a validation. It's like you said about the open house. When you do an open house, you're also going because people are coming in to interview you. This is someone I want to represent me. And I think the same thing happens here. I have had, I follow you on LinkedIn or I saw this and I get the listing. I just can't correlate. Right. It's if, a piece of the pie. Yeah. As far as like they're getting your brochures, they see you at the open house, they see your it's a uh, Instagram account. So it's just a piece of the pie. Right. I don't know. I mean, obviously you guys are doing a lot of videos. I see them and spending a lot of time, effort, money, right? Um, that's a portion, right? But you have to do open houses. You have to network with other client or other agents. You have to do open houses. You have to rent, send handwritten notes. I mean, you have to do the whole package. And I think a lot of times we've talked about like what is successful. It's doing all the things doing the client events and doing the parties. The videos are just one more thing that I've come into play. Are you on TikTok? Ish. Ish. I mean, so can Max, you might know the answer to this. Can you not like take that video that you're doing and just parlay it over to TikTok? Oh, you, I think you could, those would, those would go fine. Well, I have, but like it's, it, it hasn't kicked for me. Um, so I'm, I, and I'm, I, I'm not the person to know digital and marketing right. media. But, I'm not sure how the TikTok works or how the Instagram. Work. So we're pulling it together and seeing. Um, yeah, I'm trying. So what's a typical day in the life of Daryl Judy? Um, typical day is I used to, I hurt my leg, but I used to get up and do the gym so, right away. So, okay. Yeah. When I walked in, I saw the boot. So you hurt your leg playing tennis, playing tennis, ankle. Um, no, um, I tore some calf muscles. Oh, man. I heard a pop when I was playing oh. and I'm like, Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. But it's just, it's a fine. I'll be in therapy a bit and it's good. Um, it's not Achilles. Yeah. Um, that was freaking out. Yeah. That's that was freaking scary. Out. Right. That was bad. So I'm an early riser. I get up, I make my coffee, do my thing. I'm in the office early. Um, I happen to live in my office, which is easy and to get sort of the commute time. I'm in the office usually by 8 a.m. every morning. Right. And I'm there till five, six. And I think that's a big part of it. Um, but I, we have company meetings I do. I have a team I work with. Um, every day is a little different, though. Every day is different. Like, I had a coaching seminar this morning. I was out on the sidewalk being coached. Um, I have this today. I have tour this afternoon. I have an event tonight. So it just kind of, I don't, I'm not very good at blocking. I do this for so many hours. I do that for so many hours. Yeah, every day is very different in our, in our business. I just, my thing is I'm in the car so much lately and I just feel like I can't get anything done. I'm really, I'm really thankful that I have our team that handles all of the contracts, all of the listing stuff, all of the MLS stuff, because I used to do all of that myself and I'm in the car so much now. I, I, I can't even stop to text. It's just ridiculous. Right. You're too expensive to do that, right? Your time is better spent caring for a client. That's what you should be doing. And so like, as we're doing this now, I have this um, assistant email who is a rock star. I love her to death. And so she's putting through a counter offer on a contract, right? A great contract. So I don't have to worry about that because I will surround myself by good people. Yeah. So how many people are on your team currently? Um, right now, there's three of us. So mm -hmm. we have um, an assistant email and we have Danny Boytel who's joined. Um, he's been a rock star. Mm -hmm. He's He had his license before and did a lot of rentals, but realized he just wasn't making the money. And so he came. Um, he's been here like nine months, I think. Really smart very likable, knowledgeable, and his average sales price is higher than mine. He's, oh, wow. his average sales price is 2.2. .2. I mean, I'm like, oh How'd my that God. Happen? <laughs> he, you know how it happened? Like um, a couple things like, and that's why I said about doing all the bits and pieces, right? So he joined the firm. I'm like, you got to get yourself out of that role and into the role of the professional. You got to, so we we're sending out announcements. He's like, mm, it's kind of cheesy. I don't, I'm like, send it out. He's like, I don't want to, it just seems, I'm like, I, the only money I want you to spend are stamps. I want you to spend stamps and let everyone know you're doing it. Well, he sent one out 
and got a $2.7 million listing off of a friend's father, right? And it was like, I like you, I want you to do it, but I know who you're working with in this firm. And if it was just other firms, maybe, you know, I wouldn't have done it, but she's like, I'm going to have you do it. Success, right? He did another one, postcard. Um, the friend sold it. And I'm like, so you did a great job there, but how are you propelling that sale into more sales? Mm -hmm. What do you mean? Well, who are the brothers? Who are the sisters? Who do they go to school with? How did you, right? Because then he did that, he got a $2.2 million sale and he closed yesterday in something that was 1.5 or 1.6. So connecting the pieces and letting other people know your success and yeah. the trust and the confidence and this fear of influence. Yeah, essential sphere of influence and just notifying, basically. Yeah, yeah. I don't I don't want a big massive team. I don't understand the people that have thirty and forty people. I Those just are like small firms. Yeah, it's a small firm. Yeah, like the Robin Brent group. We, yes. We are we're they're getting, they're getting, they're getting a little big yes. over there. We're we keeping it I think we have eleven now. That's kind of like ten is our threshold. So uh the dirty details of your group. Um so the gentleman you just mentioned, a couple of listings, does that go under his MLS ID or yours? His. His. Right. I'm not him. So okay. the, the other thing, too, is I don't like – and what everyone does and works for them, their right. business is good. For me, I want him to be successful. I want to change his life. I want him to make a lot of money. And I want him to get credit for what he's doing. Right. So he comes in and he sells it. It's his name. Right. You know, if he sells more than I do this year, good for him. That's legit. Yeah. We're just, we're in the same boat. So, I mean, there are teams out there and groups that will keep everything under like one MLS ID, which I think is a little shady, uh, but it works for them. But for us, it's like if we want them to have street cred, because what's going to happen is they're going to be a buyer agent going up against a heavy header. And the first thing they're going to do is probably like a home snap with their MLS tag and see they've done zero deals. So it's going to put them in a, a backseat position if they're in a multiple offer situation with a heavy header. Well, I can see it both ways. Um, I think what you're doing is fantastic. I mean, that's basically how I've worked with Jonathan Taylor for many years. He's always been extremely generous about that. When we share deals or buy my own deals, it's like it's in my name, you know, and but we work together. Right. You have a com camaraderie. Exactly. Um, but I also see it on the team side, too. It's like, OK, if we're going to put all of this marketing and fo focus and do it on the team model, then the, the team is the branding. The team is where we have the power, so to speak. and these two types of, uh, you know, different techniques work on different types of clients. Some clients want to work with an individual agent who might be on a small group. And some people want like the power of like, oh, we've got 11 people working for us and they're spread out all over the place. This is awesome. So either way, that's, I mean, the team thing is extremely popular right now, but it is like running a small company. It's like running a stressful. small company. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Management. And we're actually having our mid-year reviews coming up in the next two weeks. So making sure everybody's on track with their numbers and what can we do better as team leads, things like that. But yeah. you're good at that. I mean, you're adding, you're adding a, a layer of other work to the, to the business, but it's about growth and it's about, you're bringing along like this other group of people, newer agents, and they need that. They need that teamwork. So it's good. Kudos. Thank you. Good job. Daryl, this is great stuff. Uh, you've imparted, Great knowledge and experience. We thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. Brent's got rapid fire questions for you. Rapid fire, five easy questions. What is your guilty pleasure outside of real estate? My guilty pleasure? I'd like to say tennis, if I was able to play. You'll be back. I mean, it's, it's just, yeah. you know, it's just, it, it, here's what I say. It, it's shorter than you think it's gonna be to get better, but it's also longer than you want it to be. Right, that's what it is. Right, right, right. Yeah. Um, no, 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 so a guilty pleasure. Um, honestly, and it's not guilty. Um, I feel like the guilt I have is I wanna be here all the time doing all the work, but a guilty pleasure is getting away with friends and family and really digging in, spending time together and really doing that. And on a smaller note, a guilty pleasure, like after, going in the office at eight and, you know, working till eight, nine, 10, from like nine to 11, I just want to watch trash TV. I don't want to talk to anybody. I don't want to read. I want to see some trash or something on Netflix <laughs> and not talk. I don't want to talk. I don't want to engage. I just want to be left. What alone. about, what about when you're watching your trash TV and you're finally like, you're turning into a vegetable on your couch and you see that call come in? I stop. 
I stop. I'm like, I have to go back and this is terrible. I have to go back and rewind. I was watching Staircase the other night on Netflix. Um, I had to go back and rewind because then I get caught up in all the things that are going on and realize I just lost 20 minutes of the show. Right. And yeah, so yeah. I would like to stop myself, but you know, in this business, I'm not someone's like, oh, I'm not going to, I'll answer my emails tomorrow. I'll respond to you tomorrow. I don't take calls after eight. I mean, that is insane to me. Right. And so if someone calls me at eight o'clock at night, I'm going to get, hi, how can I help? Right. Yeah. So I totally agree. So trash TV, do you have a favorite trash show? <laughs> I like all of like the trash Bravo stuff, right? Below deck. I love that. I, I mean, who doesn't love housewives of New Jersey and New York? I mean, pure, I mean, I love it. Is Brent, Teresa do you watch still, housewives? I watched that one. Cause like Teresa and her husband had that Teresa issue. Is she in jail? I don't even know. No, she's out of jail and she's making money and she's got remarried. Oh, wow. Joe Judice. Is that his name? Yeah. Her brother has been exiled. I think to Italy. Yes. All right. Trash I, TV. I, I was just, I was just guessing, and you do, you do know it. Look at we watched a lot of TV, so we, I guess, up until like 2017, we watched a lot of trash TV, the Bravo shows. I'm a huge Kardashian fan, and then we got rid of TV for like three years because of that. It's like I would just be in there watching like trash. What's well, it's different now because now you can watch. You have HBO Plus, and you have Netflix, and you have yeah. so much. Right? Yeah, it's crazy. Oh, Yellowstone. I mean, Yellowstone. I love that. So that was the my best. that was my COVID. Yeah. Don't think I don't own Wranglers, right? And like I was oh, like, yeah. oh my god, I love loved that Yellowstone. is the best. I can't wait till next. That guy time. Taylor Sheridan is hilarious though when he shows up on the horse, like Jimmy. You know, he does the whole <laughs> thing spinning the horses, just like making himself look awesome. It's like his show, right? I love that. And Beth, like I've so yes. many times, Beth I want to have oh, Beth Dutton. I want to have those moments and go in and wreck that store. Yeah. I, don't know, I, I have to hold back, but I want to do it. Yeah. So Max is going to write a movie just for you. Yeah, it's a script. The script. So who's going to play you in this movie? Oh, my God. Not based on, well, is it based on looks or who I think is going to? I don't know. Whatever. How would you do it? Um, I wish I wish I had the physique and the look of Jack Gyllenhaal. Right? Yeah. Jack Gyllenhaal? Jake? Jake. Jake. I'm sorry, Jake Gyllenhaal. Well, you don't know his name, but we know who he is. Right. I was Gyllenhaal. trying to think, like, is, there, is he got a brother? Jack? Yeah, Jack. Jack. No, J no, Jake. Jake and his sister, right? So yeah, Jake. Yeah. Maggie, Maggie, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. talking about oh, Jake's awesome. Yeah, like a good spirit, aging well, masculine, attractive. I mean, he doesn't want to see himself as looking great. Yeah, but yeah. Hollywood aging is different. I mean, well, we need the, we need the Hollywood surgeons, I'm telling you. Like, we got to look good, too. So moisturize steam room. Yeah. You're yeah. Moisturize, moisturize every day. Yes. All right. Every See? day. Yeah. No, I just saw like, and it's interesting too. Like I just saw Elvis last night. It premiered in, how did um, you see it? Um, my friends who are in the movie industry. And so Susan, a good friend of mine invited me to this preview. It is, I'm not even an Elvis person. It is unbelievable. Okay. You've heard it here. And that kid is going to be up for an Oscar if he doesn't win. I promise you. I'm um, there. yeah, but looking at Tom Hanks, to allow himself to be, I mean, he looks horrid, right? But he does a great job. So, yeah. Yeah. So sometimes Hollywood would like some of the, the darker. Well, I'm glad to hear that because I was worried it looked a little bit overdone in the previews. So, oh my God. Is it Baz Luhrmann, I think, is who does it, mm -hmm. right? It is so good. And if you didn't love Elvis before, you'll at least respect right, him and right. the journey. And it's also, it's, it's, it's a little bit Michael Jackson. It's a little bit like, the drugs and how people were controlling them. It's kind of a sad story. We already have our tickets for Friday at six o'clock at the Alamo draft house. I promise you you're and it's, it's long. Get it's a like couple of beers. Hours, right? It's like, it was three hours, but there was a bit of in time between. Yeah. So it's probably like two forty or something. But you're taking your son, right? Yeah. My how old's so your son? We, he's eight. So we watched Maverick. Everyone knows this uh, four times. And the, one of the previews is Elvis. So now all he listens to is like Elvis on Google or Alexa. He's doing research on Elvis. So he's going to go out of his mind. And it's done. Is it so safe for an eight year old? I mean, because there's some drugs. And, um, there's it's sex, the, drugs, and rock and roll. Um, it's it's a not smidge a of, podcast. There's a smidge of recreational, but not a ton. It's more of, you know, no he's. Spoilers, sorry. I'm, 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 just, I'm just asking. <laughs> no, no. It's more of, the, of the, his agent who Tom Hanks plays who basically is like, I don't care what has to happen, he's get on stage tonight. And so they basically, you know, made him perform like Michael Jackson, right? He needs to sleep, put him out. He needs to get up, 
Let's give wow. him something. So you'll see needles. But so much of it is about the music and how it came and what it was going through. It's okay. unbelievable. That's yeah. awesome. We got to see it. You have a favorite vacation spot? Favorite vacation spot. Um, Some place I could actually go and get away and not think about work or life or bills. Just um, so it had to be something like I love going to Greece. Wow. I love Greece, right? To go away because that to me has so many memories. Um, something like that. I love Buenos Aires, but um, yeah, I like to go post COVID. I need to get to my next yeah. thing somewhere, somewhere a little bit further. Further. Like. The next place I want to go once I feel safe about travel, I want to go to Israel. You have a favorite book. I have a favorite book. You know, it's so funny. Um, in terms of book, I, I, you saw the, the logo that I did. I have a tree, right? Yes. Um, and there's a, several reasons why I did that. And one of the things is the giving tree. It's a children's book that I used to use when I taught. But it just talks about this tree that keeps giving and giving and giving. And when you can't give more, you give more. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call it a children's book. Children's giving tree. Last question here. Um, you have a favorite restaurant that you like to go to? frequently <laughs> i am such a creature of habit like i should be able to go to like rate you know james beard and that's you know five stars four stars whatever i am so lazy at the end of the day i like walk two blocks to like 17th street or walk up 14th street right my favorite is like a tequila and fish tacos so i'll go to um you know, maybe laurel plaza or uh, um but the place that I go probably more than any other place and it's because it's like my kitchen is Annie's like old school wow. on 17th street. Yeah. That is old school. It I is don't know so old is. school. It's on and 17th you, Annie Steakhouse. Oh my That's God. Like... If you got Mano at night, you got Al in the morning, you got like, it's, it's not fancy, but it's like you go there, they're like, Hey, do you want tequila or do you want a dirty martini up shaken hard? You know what I mean? It's like that's to me, it's a home. It's right. I can go anywhere and eat and it's not even like, it's not like it's cheap, you know, but it's, it's an experience. And that's where if I call four or five friends, they're like, Oh my God, yeah, let's go. Because instantaneously it's like your living room and you're, you're talking. That's awesome. Yeah. So it's, it's not as much about the food as it's about the experience and the people who are there. It's like life, right? Yes. Daryl, thanks for sharing your time with us today. Thank really you. appreciate it. Um, we always make a donation to the charity of our guest choice. So do you have any charities you want to shout out? Oh my God. That's a, I actually, um, the, the one that I give the most money to is my church, Foundry Methodist. Um, but you can give to whoever you want. Like there's right now, I think the people who need it most are, um, I have to check and see there's a place that you can help people in Ukraine. Okay. Um, I just did a fundraiser with one of my clients and um, so I can get you that. Just people who actually really, really need okay. some assistance. Perfect. Thanks for listening to Keyed In with your hosts, Max and Brent, unlocking the minds of the industry's top real estate professionals. For more information on selling your home, find us online at keyedinpodcast.com. Remember to subscribe to Keyed In on Apple Podcasts or wherever you like to listen to podcasts. Follow us on Instagram at Keyed In Podcast, at Raven Max, and at Brent E. Jackson. And follow Max on TikTok at Maxwell Rabin underscore properties. Oh, oh, oh.